Sasha for inviting me to actually participate tonight and also for allowing Loyola to actually partner with uh, the, the center as well. And as Chris had indicated, this is something that we wanted to do for quite a long time. And uh, really what we hope more than anything is that we can actually, if you have needs and also your own development plan, you want to reach out to Loyola for any of the science departments, we'd be thrilled to actually make those types of connections. So now I say that and after you actually hear the why just doing a demo? My guess is you aren't going to want to interact with me, which is usually the effect that I actually have. So um, I think it's fairly clear as well that I don't think that Natasha totally knows what she got herself into because she has scheduled a friend and models to talk before they actually eat. So uh, all I can say is that most of the demos that I would have done, my wife encouraged me not to do those. So if you're interested, I'll take you over to my lab, which is actually across the way. But, uh, uh, last time I did a talk in this building, I was actually encouraged not to do a talk again in this building. I can tell you that. So Chris mentioned his and cockroaches, and you may see some of the ones that I released last time. So um, what I'm going to try to do tonight is I'm going to talk a little bit about the area that I'm quite passionate about, which is actually all things forensic. But uh, not for the same reason that probably your students are, because my understanding is most high schools, maybe I made us too strong. Many high schools in the state of Maryland actually now offer a forensic science course. Uh, in fact, at Loyola, we have an evening course that's going on right now that actually is taught by a high school teacher from Oakley, and he teaches our intro to forensic science. And it's incredibly popular. Everything in forensic is actually exploding right now. And I actually have a passion in a very small area where you actually use insects to actually try to address a whole range of crimes. And so I'm going to introduce you that to you, which is part of what my goal is. I'll talk a little bit about my research. I don't think I fulfilled the cutting edge aspect that was actually just told you that we're going to do, but um, it's cutting edge to me. I guess I should say that. Um, and what I'm also going to talk about a little bit is how some of this can actually be integrated into the classroom. And I think that's something I've talked about quite a bit. And when you actually wind up teaching insects, nine times out of ten, the student that's actually there doesn't want to be there. So you probably are quite familiar with the student who doesn't want to sit in your class. Well, I have that every day because I teach all things in vertebrates. And so I spend a heck of a lot of time trying to figure out how do I actually get you excited and motivated for a topic that you're not. So one aspect for me is just to simply I just share my passion about all this stuff. Um, it usually works. If you put forensic in front of anything, they're interested in that. In fact, biology students at Loyola are interested in two things. People that are alive and people that are dead. So that seems to be, you can, you can teach 100% of the students. We actually teach courses on medicine and courses on forensic. So I'll try to introduce you to that as we actually go. Now I think one of the goals that we actually have is to share a little bit about background and also kind of educational experience. How did I get where I got? Well, much to the demise of my parents, I did not become a real doctor. So never had that passion. I don't particularly care for people. And apparently that is kind of the criteria for actually working with people as well. Um, I was someone who was always out in the woods playing. I did not have an insect collection. David and I talked about this just a little while ago. That was not me. I didn't collect insects to actually kill and stick them in. I actually collected them from farms. I brought them back and I tormented them, but I kept them alive and actually studied them because um, I thought that they were cool. But I didn't have plans that I was going to become an entomologist. My plan was, after doing a lot of high school science fair projects, so I was going to wind up being a geneticist. And it turns out, I think my first course in genetics, that I wasn't any good at that, which seems to be a problem if you're going to actually make that your career. What I really found that I enjoyed about genetics was working with fruit flies, so, which was not obvious to me, but after I, I worked with them um, and we went on to college, I started working with an entomologist who just immediately assumed that I wanted to become an entomologist. And I thought, no, I just want to do research. And next thing I know, 20 some, 30 some years later, this is what I do. So at Loyola, I've been here since 1994. I probably like you. When I was hired originally, I was asked to teach pretty much everything. Um, you know, not normal courses, but certainly you, you didn't specialize, that's for sure. You, you, you filled in gaps, and that's what, it did, what we've done. Loyola has evolved over time, and so I've taught an awful lot of stuff over that period of time, but it's becoming more and more focused. I'm now the director of forensic studies at Loyola, and so I teach a lot more in the realm of forensics than I used to, but that wasn't how I started. So just to kind of give you an idea of you know, how I got here. So what I'm eventually going to talk about is what kind of advice can you give to your students if they're thinking that this is what they want to do, but we'll save that toward the end as well. So um, what I want to do is kind of talk a little bit about what is forensic entomology, 
And so I made this comment just a few minutes ago that in reality, all things forensic science are just exploded. So everybody knows this. Just about every college and university now is offering at least a course that's related to forensic science. Oftentimes it specializes forensic bio, forensic entomology is a relatively rare topic to actually offer. So it's forensic chemistry. You can actually get a uh, undergraduate master's degree over Townsend. Um, and down at, at University of Maryland, it's announced they're doing a forensic medicine degree that you can now get. As I understand it, I think only students from China can actually sign up at the moment. So that don't know how many are teaching from China, but probably not too many at this point. I don't understand that completely. Um, but it's part of the CSI effect as well. So every every show on television, particularly if you watch CBS, is in some type of crime show. So just between CSI, NCIS, and Law and Order, I think that represents 105 shows, or give or take. Um, they've got it covered. And, and I had somebody actually ask this question. They said, so why is the U.S. obsessed with crime? And I don't have an answer for why, but I can tell you that since the history of television in this country, this has been a trend that has been there. Perry Mason was one of the most popular shows that was on TV in the late 50s. So this is nothing new. We're just seeing it in another generation. Quincy was my idol. I can't stand CSI personally. So what goes around comes around, I guess is what I should say. And there's lots of benefits that has actually come from this. There's lots of negatives that have come from this. We don't have a lot of time to talk about all that. But I will say my branch of forensic science, forensic entomology, has been a beneficiary of all these television shows because nobody cared about insects. And next thing you know, they're showing the CSI that you've got maggots crawling on a body. And then if you actually have any idea what are, and then you actually have a little bit of information about development, well, you can actually apply that to a crime. And so forensic entomology has benefited enormously. Our population has exploded in the United States, meaning we're up to about So that, that's exploded. <laughs> so, um, this is where I should have said, because I heard home, and I made a comment earlier that normally, when I'm thinking properly, um, I make a statement that I'm going to show some graphic uh, images on there. I'm like, um, so that's not the only one, but I, I don't try to uh, uh, lock these types of images from the standpoint, this is what it really is. So if you've got students who are interested in it, they need to know what they're actually dealing with, quite honestly. Forensic entomology, what is it? Well, if I had to define it, then the simplest way to talk about it is, is it just, it winds up being where you actually have arthropod science colliding with the judicial system. And so I use the broad term of arthropod science, and in reality, that's not even true. It's really arthropods that exist in a terrestrial environment. So, because once you get into aquatic systems, they, anything in there becomes much less useful. Not totally useless, but much less useful. The reality is what forensic entomology is, is that you're actually dealing with insects more than you are just arthropods as a whole. And so, you're trying to use aspects of insect biology uh, activity of insects, or even just fragments of insects, and in trying to draw conclusions about a criminal case, uh, or a civil case, which is actually more apt to be what you're actually dealing with in this particular case. So, and that information requires that you have a very strong background in understanding what insects do, what they look like, and being able to identify them as well. So we'll look at that a little bit. If you're curious, the individual that's on the bottom slide is actually alive, which most people are shocked to see that. This is a, a medical condition in which maggots have infested his dead tissues that were actually in his gums first and then they actually migrated into the sinus cavities. It's called myasis. And forensic entomology also deals with that. What I want to talk about is to kind of set a foundation where we will look a little bit about what is forensic entomology. Well, I just defined it. But in reality, I didn't define the whole thing. So I will do that for you. And then what we're going to do is we're really going to get down to nuts and bolts. We're going to talk about what students are really interested in, and that's dead things. So there is a branch of medical part of forensic entomology called medical criminal or medical legal entomology. And we'll spend the majority of the time talking about that. Our majority of time will probably be about 20 minutes, so not a whole lot. And then once we have that baseline information, we'll apply it. And we'll look at what types of situations in the legal system are you really looking at? And they really will be crimes because that's what medical criminal takes a look at. So I'll first define for you then what forensic entomology really is. And the reality is that there's actually three subdisciplines. So now the top one is the one that gets all the TV time. So when you actually have a situation where that bugs or maggots have actually been found upon a body, 
so does abuse, so does uh, neglect. And it's not restricted to just humans because pet abuse is actually one of the fastest growing crimes in the United States. In fact, in Florida, they estimate that they have 300 new cases that are taking place each month, and that there's inside evidence that they actually have from many of those situations that actually can be used in the prosecution itself. So, why Florida? Because they have a medical entomologist down there who's actually keeping track of this type of data. We really don't have those types of numbers for most of the other states. So, the other two subranches are ones that aren't nearly as sexy. So, you don't get TV time talking about insects are in my house. So, that, that's not a career changer usually. So, and, and urban entomology is exactly what we're looking at. We're looking at insects that invade human habitation. Not the city, but wherever we live and the environment that's surrounding that as well. And, and we'll look at that just for a brief moment here in a second, as well as insects and store product entomology that invade our food. So, again, this is why I don't do demos before that we actually eat, because I could fully illustrate this to you. And when I, when I give a talk for elementary school kids, I usually like to put on a nice little show where I fill a box full of beetles, or cereal box full of beetles, seal it back shut. Somebody opens it, they dump out, everybody's crying, parents call. <laughs> it's terrible. So, and I do it every single time, because you got to have something that you can have a teacher. So, these are the two areas that I'm telling you that um, are the ones that don't get all the airtime, but, but you'd be very familiar with some of the examples. And I, and I should point out that just because, in the case of urban entomology, that an insect gets in my house doesn't mean that I can go sue somebody. So, nor does it mean that it's a forensic entomology matter, because it happens all the time. So, we're talking about when you're, you have a situation where that there's a legal situation that kicks in, such as you paid somebody, like, say, Orkin, to come in and treat your house for keeping cockroaches out, or you had a cockroach problem, or you have a termite problem. <coughs> Two months later, after that, you've actually paid probably $1,000 for them to actually come, they're back. So, now you're tipped off, and so you enter into a civil suit because you don't believe that they actually honored the contract. It was an urban entomology problem all the way across the board. It became a forensic urban entomology problem when the lawsuit was actually filed. So, and one of the biggest issues that's taking place in this particular area is that bed bugs are back. And everybody knows this. There's a number of reasons for it. Or nobody's exactly sure which is the right one. But the fact that you have a bed bug in a hotel that you stay in doesn't mean that you have a legal case whatsoever. That doesn't immediately make their forensic entomology matter. It might, but the investigation has to take place. In the southeast, they're dealing with fire ants, and they're finding that you can't even sue pest control companies anymore because none of them will guarantee that they can get rid of the red imported fire ant because they are vicious and they're like nothing we've ever seen before. So, in the case of sort of product entomology, the only time it becomes a big forensic matter is when you wind up having a situation that the insects in your food exceed some kind of threshold that's considered unacceptable. Now, for my wife, that means they got in my house in the first place, so they never got anywhere near the food. But the reality is, if you take a look at what the FDA standards are, the defect action levels come up. It's a wonderful guide to actually read. So if you, if you just have some free time, like you're not grading ever, um, then take a look at it during the weekend, and you would be quite surprised of all the things that are allowable in your food, and not just insects. In fact, you'll say, I'm OK with the insects. It's everything else that I'm not so thrilled about now. And most people say, I just won't eat anymore. That might be wise. Intravenous is the way to go out here, so take a look at that. So, these two areas are the biggest areas of forensic entomology, but this is not what drives everybody into the field. So, but you'll make a fortune if you actually go this way. So, and of course, I picked the one that you don't. So, that's just <laughs> tremendous. So, so, what most people think of when they think about this topic is the medical criminal. And the reason that they think about that is the airtime that it's actually had on television. So we've got the CSI effect that we talked about, but you've got other shows that have a powerful impact. Baltimore's own Mike Rowe on Dirty Jobs, in several episodes he deals with insects. And the image that you see right here is when he visited Purdue University's decom lab and actually climbs into the dumpster with the pig that's decomposing and they teach him all the tricks of forensic entomology. So it was one of his least favorite things to actually do. Mythbusters also. The guys always seem like the, the bright. But apparently one of the myths that they're trying to bust is can insects actually get into a car and actually reach a decomposing body? And the dude with the beret, who I don't know his name because I don't watch the show, was convinced that you can. And I thought, <coughs> you have to be kidding me, because they most definitely can. So, but it comes down to the, the, the really, how much you spend for the car. If you got a Lexus, they're not getting in easily. If you drive what I drive, well, it's like you don't have to <laughs> So. <laughs> 
They will get there. The, one of the other reasons that this is an area that people really like it is because humans are attracted to the gross and the cop. It's why that we watch those crime shows in the first place. And talking about that you've got flies wiggling around in the eyeballs of the body is gross. Yet at the same time, nobody has gotten up yet. You're still listening. And that's exactly what the students do as well. So, and I can tell you, Chris made a comment that I, I'm actually known on this campus. I have a tendency to place dead things out on our campus. I put them in cages because we all know that the rats and the cats will drag things away in the inner city. And I've had more than one feral cat try to get my stuff and drag it in cold spring. So, so I go for bigger things too. I'll put out cow heads, which you can get at any other meat markets as well. And when I've stuck those out there, you and I have a tendency to do it when we have college visitation days. It's just a kind of thing. It's not that I would ever do that deliberately. What you find is that everybody looks at this and you hear it. They're all, that is gross. Just wait. Get my picture. And everybody runs over and they get the cell phones out and they're getting their selfies or they're getting their picture. It's gross, but it's fascinating and they want to be part of this. There is absolutely no doubt they want to be part of this. So you're going to see where I'm going with this as well because you can use the gross to actually get students who otherwise don't care about the topic to pay attention. So, which is a really, really cool thing. So now, we talk about the science itself, folks, the forensic entomology, the medical criminal. What is it that you really can get from the insects itself? There's a number of things. I can talk on and on and on and on, and you probably want to get home tonight, so I won't do that. But I will tell you that there are two main things that stand out. One of those is that certain insects allow you to be able to estimate a portion of the postmortem interval which is usually defined as a time since death. Now, when it's stated that way, it's a lie. But everybody does it because it's, it's simplistic. Insects cannot tell you the time since death. They can estimate a portion. They can only tell you that portion from the time that they actually reach the body and colonize it until the time that you actually discover it. So there's always going to be a window of time that occurred before that. So now, if this is an early colonizer, so that it shows up within minutes of death, well, it's pretty good at being but it's not going to be perfect. So the other thing that you might be able to do is be able to determine if I discover a body right here, has it always been right here? So it hasn't been moved. And I can do that by recognizing that certain insects are unique to biogeographic climates. So if you move that body to a region that that insect's not found in, that should leave out, or it can be something as simple as someone tried to dispose of the body in water first, and then it re, I mean, normally a body that hasn't been decomposed much will sink, and then when it blows, it will actually float again. So if someone is not happy about this, and they actually take that body out of water and they put it in a terrestrial situation, there will probably be aquatic insects on that body that tells me it has not always been in this location. So it doesn't have to be that it was moved to a new region, it just might be moved from here to here. So those are the two things that we really seen now. Now, for you to be able to do that, this would be the second graphic picture, but yet there was no move this time. So you will all become seasoned. That's fantastic. I should have brought the maggots and the, the dead stuff with me. So um, for you to be able to estimate either one of those two pieces of information, there are certain characteristics that you have to have within insects. And number one on that list is that they really need to be necrophagous. Now, necro meaning dead and vagus meaning to eat. So they feed upon the dead. And the important aspect here is that they exclusively feed those are the most useful insects. There's a number of scavengers that will arrive and leave and arrive and leave, and they're not going to be very useful in this particular case. There are also some insects that will show up to eat the other insects that are actually colonizing the body. So they're truly, they, they could be feeding on the body, they could be necrophagous, but they're probably also going to be opportunistic with predators or parasites. They're useful, they're not nearly as useful as the first category. What's also important here is to have insects themselves in which that their developmental data is actually well characterized. Because if you don't know it, then you're going to have to do it if someone actually presents this to you as a case that they need your help with. We also need the insects to be poikilothermic. And I can put this out to my students because they have no idea what I'm talking about and it sounds much more difficult than it is. It's a type of ectotherm that actually the body temperature varies with environment. That's absolutely essential. This is why that vertebrates are not nearly as useful for actually time of death determinations because they don't reflect what's going on in the environment. Because after a corpse has been outside for 18 hours, it becomes a poikilotherm as 
well. So the insects and the corpse are one in that particular regard, and that's essential to the beginning. So those are some of the characteristics. What type of insects actually represent that more than anything else? What we call necrophagus dipter, fancy way of saying flies. So, why the flies? Because the flies that specialize on animal remains, actually their juvenile stages, larvae, what we affectionately call maggots, are exclusively going to be necrophagus. They feed only on the body. They don't leave that body unless disturbed, and if they leave it, they come right back because they're chemically attracted. So their development is entirely tied to the corpse. And that's the key for being able to use them. We also know a lot of information about them, such as that many species are predictable in terms of when they will arrive and where that they will actually occur. In the state of Maryland, that's incredibly important because if I travel 50 miles to the west, the type of environment that I am, am in doesn't represent what's going on here at all. If I go to Eastern Shore, that's an entirely different situation as well. I have to have all of that characterized because if I find bodies in those three different zones, data I generate in Baltimore is not relevant to what's going on in these extreme counties whatsoever. So, what's also highly important is that the flies themselves display what we call determinate growth. They have a fixed number of developmental stages that doesn't change. And many of the other insects that wind up showing up, it's variable. So, this makes flies the most important ecological data that's going to be associated with the body decomposing almost anywhere. And in fact, nothing else trumps them. So to put this in perspective, in the first 72 hours after death, forensic medicine is the most useful tool to actually be able to assess all the characteristics of what happened to that body in a constant manner. After that 72 hours, you increasingly are becoming dependent upon ecological data, and these are the most important. There is nothing else. Now, my botanist friends might disagree with me, but they're usually wrong. So keep that in mind. <laughs> that might be wrong. So these are some of the common flies that we might actually encounter. So I just want to introduce you to, to some of those. So these flies are going to be specific to the time that they would actually show up. So the one actually in the top left and the bottom actually are very, very common flies. They don't feed on the same thing, but they do use the body and they can be there at the same time. The common house fly is the one that's on the bottom right, and actually you can find it almost any time of year. So if you found it anywhere in the world, you're not surprised. The one that's in the top right is one that actually is not out there anymore. It hasn't been since the middle of August. So it's a flesh fly. So if you find a flesh fly on that body in Baltimore today, you know that body's been moved. So that's the first thing that it tells you. And the beast that's on the bottom left is one that's becoming more and more important in the United States. It was accidentally introduced into the U.S. probably in the mid uh, it's called the hairy maggot blow fly. It actually runs rampant all throughout the South. Um, the significance of this beast is that it actually is predatory and also cannibalistic. And it tends to show up slightly after the first wave of colonizers. So it eats everything that showed up first, and it's the only thing that appears to be there. So you mistakenly think it's the oldest insect, but it isn't. So, and this is actually partly what we found in the Casey Anthony murder trial as well. I'm going to actually talk just briefly about most people don't pay any attention to that entomologists were actually significant in that particular case. Lots of different families of flies that are relevant. I put them in the order of significance. If we were talking about body decomposing outside in Maryland, then from top to bottom is the way it would go. If I change the scenario that I move the body indoors, it completely changes the array that I actually have. So, beetles usually also come up in conversations <coughs> about uh, eating the dead. And if you've watched the documentary The Mummy with Brandon Fraser, that you know that apparently that if you make the mistake of actually being in an Egyptian pyramid, you may be eaten by beetles as well, completely, that there's nothing left. Turns out that's a lie. Um, beetles generally don't do that at all. And what we find is that most of the time, beetles fall into that second category that I gave you of characteristics that are important. They are necrophagous, but they're also predatory. And so when they do show up, it's usually after the flies. If I try to estimate the postmortem info, it's going to be a wider period of time than I have, so it's not nearly as precise. So you may not actually have any influence on an alibi that someone actually has when you're using people data only. Most important, perhaps, is the fact that they display indeterminate growth. So if you change certain conditions like temperature, the amount of food, or also if there's overcrowding, then it can change how many developmental stages that they have. It can go from just five to as many as 20. 
In which case, you show up, you have no idea how long you've been there. So you can make broad statements, you can't make specific statements. So, and there's, like the flies, we have a lot of common species, and these beetles themselves are specialized for times of year, and also for <coughs> timing during decomposition of when they actually show up as well. So when you study forensic entomology, you have to have a, a really good sense of being able to identify the insects and have outstanding observation skills, because you're repeating what you're doing over and over again, create baseline data, so that you can apply it to a real world situation. Okay. That's kind of like the foundational work of how do you use insects, so how do we apply that now? So, I mean, it seems intuitively obvious, but it may not be when I actually show you that here are some of the crimes that I can apply that to. So, medical criminal entomology covers a lot. So, and there's no way that we have time to talk about all of those. So, without a doubt, we've got to talk about death, because death is really cool. So, we'll do that just briefly. But we can see that it ranges anywhere from being able to use them as tools that would aid a chemist that's doing toxicological work all the way to the modern threat of terrorism. And so we'll take a look at just a few examples to kind of give you an idea. Now that we have that information, how can I actually use this? Well, insects and death are obviously going to be where that we have a lot of the attention being applied. And in this particular case, we use the insects in a very straightforward fashion. If, if we have a suspicious death, and there are insects on the body, we would stop. Because in Baltimore and in Maryland, we wouldn't use that data in any way, shape, or form. So this is the disclaimer. So the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner doesn't use the electrical data. So they have a forensic entomologist down there, but usually they just simply take it off the body and discard it. So, which makes it unusual. Because if you simply cross the state line in Pennsylvania, they consider this, this to be very valuable data. So that said, if we have that scenario, what you would wind up doing is you would try to determine what's the oldest insect on the body. Now intuitively you would say, well, if I protect the adults, I've got the oldest. And that's true. But the adults actually aren't necrophagous or they're not exclusively necrophagous. And you have no idea that they actually have that body or not. So the oldest that are feeding are the immature, are the maggots. And so you're trying to collect the oldest. And most people will tell you, well, they're the biggest. Well, that's what the literature says, but that's not true. So because size doesn't matter because Normally, this is a resource that's going to be filled with everybody that specializes on dead, because you never know when it's going to occur. It's a patching and an ephemeral resource. So there's going to be intense competition, and it'll be overcrowded. So all the maggots are going to be tiny. They're going to be truncated in size, so they normally you can't use that as your indicator. So there are ways we can tell how they are without the size, but you try to collect as many as you can, some that you wind up preserving, because that's your physical evidence that's going to have to be presented in Flies are unlike any other insects. Fly larvae to be preserved have to be boiled before they're actually placed in a, an appropriate preservative. Their enzymes don't stop working in alcohol. Now, if I collect a beetle, I can throw an alcohol in the problem, but you can't do that with a fly magnet. And so if you're going to have continuity of evidence, you got to boil it first. And then what you wind up doing is you usually put it and store it at 80% ethanol. And usually it won't change after that. So, then some of those flies I'm actually going to put on a food source, I'm going to take back to the laboratory, I'm going to give it something nice and tasty to feed them on. The standard is to use liver, either pork liver or beef liver, but you usually use pork. So, not that you probably have done this, but if you set the two out and let them actually decompose for a couple of days, beef liver continues to give off blood, pork liver doesn't. So beef liver turns soupy and makes a mess. So, prefer pork. So, we raise them on pork liver so that we can actually get adults because it's much easier to try to identify that fly based on the adult. Maggots are really about two people in North America that can actually identify them to species accurately. So, so we wind up doing that, and then once we figure out who you are, then we try to determine how long have you been there. So I'm trying to determine basically how long was the oldest insect actually out there. And so we wind up using a statistic called degree day model, which is basically a fancy physiological energy budget that's based upon the flies developing using thermal energy, basically temperature from the environment. So I actually have to be able to have developmental data that's been determined in the laboratory, and I also have to have data that I get from a weather station, because I have no idea what the temperatures were prior to actually discovering the body. So I'm not going to go through the calculation, but by doing all that and determining what temperatures that the insect doesn't develop at at all, the developmental threshold, we can actually estimate how long it took to get to that state. And that's where our postmodern vehicle is actually coming from. And if I'm lucky, the body that I have has one species on it. 
if I wind up having more likely 30 species on it, I gotta do that calculation for every last one to see if it actually matches up. So it can take a while, particularly if you can't find the data for that fly from your region. So, for example, one of the most common flies that I would find in Baltimore, Forming, or Virginia is active during the spring, it's active during the fall, and there's no developmental data for it in the state of Maryland. The closest we have is for a trade group. Is that the same data that you've been using here? Everybody does, but should you? No. You don't want you not. The point with looking at development and trying to calculate that postmortem interval is everything under the sun, and not under the sun, actually influences the development of flies. And so this just gives you a partial list. So it's a lot. And if you think about the truest sense, if you've committed a murder, you're not just going to say, well, I think I'll just place that out in the woods and let nature take its course. No, you're going to place it in something. Put it in a sleeping bag, put it in an appliance, bury the body, put it behind a wall, chop the body up and place it in multiple dumpsters. Oh, well, that took place two years ago when I was teaching my course. They were playing a 911 call from a North Carolina State student who just casually calls 911 to tell them that they just killed his roommate and chopped the body up. And they said, Where is his body? And some are in this dumpster, and some are in this dumpster, and some are in this dumpster. Because mentally he was thinking, if the body's not intact, the flies won't be interested. It was just the opposite. They were more interested than ever because if the internal organs were exposed, those are the ones that are injury rich. So, Everything has an impact, so all of these factors have to be worked out as the impact that they have on fly development. You can see that just repetition, repetition, repetition is what goes on a lot. I mentioned that the Casey Anthony case, this was very instrumental because the, the turning point in the trial was actually two forensic entomologists taking each other on. One was hired by the prosecution. And he's the most famous one in North America, Neil you know, Haskell, who came in and was asked to give two different reports. Give an analysis of the insects that you're actually find in the trunk of Casey's car. If you're not familiar with this, Casey was accused of killing her two-year-old dog, Kaylee. So she said she didn't do it. So if she, if at best, she was a horrendous parent. So, um, and so they believed that the body actually had been transported in her car, probably decomposed, and then the body was actually discovered just a few Gardens from her grandparents' house, well, Kaylee's grandparents' house, fully skeletonized at that particular point. And there was insect evidence located with both. So, so the initial report indicated the first forensic entomologist came in and said the body clearly decomposed in the trunk of the car, and it was transferred over to the wooded area close to Casey's parents' house, and gave his reasons why. And then another forensic entomologist was hired by the defense, and he was only asked to come in and actually make comments about the insects that were in the trunk of the car. It's the only thing that actually went to Casey. So, in which case he said, no, none of this actually is, follows the story that he actually told. And the, the jury basically believed him. So it was what actually swayed the trial. So, if like me, that you watched weird shows on Discovery Health, Dr. G was the medical examiner for that particular case and indicated there was a ton of insect evidence that was not presented. And all I can tell you is based on what she said, Casey did it. So, if you're not doing murder, you can use insects to be surrogates of human tissue. So it's the concept behind entomotoxicology. So if you think about you are what you eat, well, the maggots are eating you. So whatever you put in your body, they put in theirs. So, and the idea behind this is that if decomposition proceeds to the point that the only thing that's left is bone and cartilage and hair, you may not have enough material to actually do a toxicological analysis. Well, that was true maybe in the late 80s but with the advances in capillary, uh, like, or capillary gas chromatography, it appears that you can use virtually just such minute tissues that the maggots probably aren't needed anymore. But what you can do is if they've consumed illicit drugs that were actually in the body or the metabolites, they bioaccumulate in the maggots. And what's important about this is that when the maggots get done feeding, they will eventually form a cocoon stage equivalent to what a butterfly or moth would do, but it's unique in the insect world in that the, the cocoon itself is made from the maggot skin, so they lift it off and it hardens, and the pupa forms on the inside. Now based on your response, you don't seem like really excited about this, this is an amazing statement, but why this is important is that those metabolites from the drug are embedded in the skin, and once it hardens, as the outer covering of the fly pupa, 
it does not change because there's no physiological or chemical event taking place. It's locked. And it's like it's in, in, in a time box that's locked for time. Or locked almost indefinitely. So people have actually found fly pupari, which is what they're actually called, from five plus years after that they actually that the fly had left, did a chemical analysis on it, and you can still detect these chemical residues. So what you can do then is a qualitative determination. What you can't do, and this is the limitation of this, it's not quantifiable. And so it hasn't held up in court to really be able to, to say, oh, X, Y, and Z is what has taken place. If you think about all of the different medications that we now take in this country, any one of those is conceivable that it could actually be detected in these flies. Importantly, you can detect it, but you also find that it may be that it alters their development as well. And anything that changes the pace of development is something that limits their utility in determining the most more mineral. So, for example, you may have heard that heroin is somewhat prominent in multiple region. So, we have oftentimes been called the heroin capital. Heroin has been found that it actually accelerates fly maggot development when actually feeding upon the metabolites or on the pure form. Now, they're high doses, but they are still equivalent to what humans would be taking. Not only does it speed up their development, but it also causes them to eat and gain weight past their optimum weights, which is remarkable just from a biological standpoint, because insects actually have a hunger center and a safety center, just like you do. This is actually suggesting that heroin causes them to ignore a signal that says I'm full, and they keep on eating, putting on weight, that their body shouldn't continue to take on. There were stop cards that tried to stop it, and it still happened. And they actually, if you determine age by size, then it gives you the impression that the flies are older than they are, and that they've been associated with the body longer than they have. Cocaine has the same effect. So if you don't know that has taken place, you cannot trust that data that you've just gotten to try to cut that was one mineral. We have no idea what Adderall or any of the learning, um, any of the learning disorder types of drugs, what impact it has on their development. So, and we know that it's all through the population have absolutely no idea what it's doing. So this is something that nobody's been looking at, they really should. Most important in this particular case is that you can also detect gunshot residue particles as well as explosive residues within their body as well. You say, well, why would I have to do that? Can I tell them there's a bullet hole? Not if you show up really, really late and you actually find that the, the body is completely decomposed, the gunshot residues are going to be gone long before, so you may have no idea that foul play was actually involved. So, just a couple of uh, other quick things. In terms of blood stain analysis, what's also known as blood spatter, flies are actually a pain in the butt because if they actually show up and they actually feed upon blood, they actually, the first thing that they do is they regurgitate. And then they defecate. So, and their defecation is liquid. And the problem that you get into is you cannot distinguish what are called fly artifacts from blood stain. Put side by side, fly spit looks just like high impact blood stains. So, and that can be from gunshot, that can be from blood force trauma itself. And if you wind up having a fly that feeds upon blood and flies to another room and leaves those spots on the window, and then a crime scene team comes in and they're actually investigating this, they have no idea. They do a presumptive blood test, it tests positive. They do a confirmatory test, it actually tests positive with for human blood. It also tests positive for the DNA of the victim. So as far as you know, that's what it is. So part of the research that I do is trying to develop a diagnostic test that allows us to distinguish fly spit from blood stain. We actually have developed an antibody that we actually can at this point. Also important to medical criminal is the fact that insects are being fashioned into weapons to be used in, as entomological uh, terrorism agents. So this is not a new concept in any way, shape, or form. So you can go back since recorded history, you can go to the Christian Bible, you can see that God and Aaron was mad at us and these insects at least three, if not four, of the plagues towards Egypt as well. So uh, you take a look at all the different ways that insects can be used. These are the three most prominent that insects have been used and are considered to be threats right now. Homeland Security has actually charged the USDA to actually come up with surveillance techniques to be on the lookout for this. The US Army is out also doing quite a bit in this particular regard. Probably the least likely threat to us is that insects are going to be released that bite and sting and cause localized havoc. That said, the US actually had the USDA actually work on this 
for uh, Operation Desert Storm because we were planning on dropping a caterpillar on uh, Stop and Saints Royal Prior to get them out of the trenches. And the caterpillar actually had a hemorrhagic venom. So it was one of the nastiest ways you could have died. So, um, in terms of using insects as vectors of disease, we have a long history in Maryland in particular, over at Fort Detrick, of doing this. And now the current threat that, that people are worried about is that with the advances in molecular biology and biology, that we can actually have insects carry pathogens that are not normal. So, in which case we're not prepared for that. The biggest threat to us would be attack on agriculture. So, and if you simply think about this, 200 million acres in the United States are planted in four crops. So all you have to do is just pick the right insect that's insecticide resistant, and if it's indigenous, then the USDA is not actually developing a surveillance program to look for something we already have. So the same is true with beef production as well as pork production. We have so few feedlots that are left for finishing these types of animals that if you have the right type of insect that actually vectors disease towards them or attacks them, you would have a massive impact, at least on our gross national product, if not our food supply. So, the point of this particular topic is students are interested in forensic entomology, and there's a wide number of topics that you can actually teach in a non traditional sense. I do this all the time. Forensic entomology does not make sense at a little arts institution where I'm trying to teach them the basics of biology, but I can teach them the basics of biology using a topic they're interested in that they would not have paid any attention to if I didn't meet them. So there's lots of different things you can do. I don't have time to be able to talk about the modules that you can do, but if you were interested in examples of black labs that I do or talks that we could probably be happy to share that with you as well. And I did want to leave you with information of what if I had students that wanted to go this way, that they wanted to go into forensic science. So lots of students want to. There's two major areas that you go into today. And Maryland is trying to become the number one training site in the United States. That is a, a goal that we're all working towards at the moment. Forensic studies and forensic science are your two options. And I'm giving you an idea of the types of college majors that you would ordinarily go into. So the blunt honesty that I always give with students is if you go this particular direction, if you're going to have a job that you can actually sustain yourself, so if you really like ramen noodles and you don't mind that you don't have a car, well, then you can pull this off with an undergraduate degree. But you probably are going to have to get a master's for either one. And if you really want to actually define what you're looking at, you probably have to get a PhD in this particular topic. But with that said, the goal for the undergraduate institutions in the state of Maryland is to try to actually increase the number of forensic jobs that occur in the state. And that's a long-term goal that we're trying to do. So by going into this area, in this particular region, then you may find that you have a shot of actually being employed. So, and again, if you have students that have an interest in this, I'd be happy to talk to them about options as well. And I, I'll give you a final thing. The two main sources for looking for information and educational materials in this area one is AAFS, the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. They have all kinds of information, including career information that's available. And if you want to find internship opportunities and um, organizations and career opportunities, the, the Forensic Studies Minor website that we actually have at Loyola, we have hundreds of links now that are actually on there that would be very, very useful for your students. So that's all the time that I have. I probably have exceeded on time. If you have any quick questions, we have to answer them. If not, now.